following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. And if you think the new internet will be based on Web3, will be decentralized and will be built on top of blockchain, I see the graph as actually the Google of blockchain. voice in the curator community since testnet and the launch of curation at the graph my conversation with jarvis covers his background in it his entry into crypto and how he found the graph and then we focus the discussion on the work of curators including what jarvis has learned in these early days of curation and his advice for those looking to take a more active role as curators working in the network we started the conversation by talking about jarvis's background I have a, a degree in computer science, and after that, I study masters in, in business administration, and I'm, I also did a PhD in the area of decision making and computer science. So I, I, I have a solid background in, in computer science. I, I have a career, almost 25 years, in, in computer science, uh, assuming very different roles in my whole career. I began as a, a developer. After that, I started uh, as a, a working with database administrator and changed to system administrator. And now I'm IT infrastructure architect. So I could build a solid background with a, a vision, a, a good vision in IT. It was a good path to have followed since my since the beginning as uh, a more uh, operational guy, and now uh, I'm, I'm I'm working with a, a broader vision with IT, uh, be, building new solutions, building uh, new infrastructure, and thinking more broad about the about the area in the in the whole discipline. You're joining me from Brazil, correct? Correct. What can you tell me about people's attitude towards crypto in Brazil? Yeah, in Brazil, many people interested in crypto. I think people are talking a lot about crypto, but I see uh, a lack of education because it's difficult to uh, secure the, uh, their keys to have uh, concerns about uh, crypto with less security. So. We need to improve this, this education as a whole. As a whole, I think it's a, it's a problem because a lot of people know about crypto. A lot of people know uh, about the technology, the huge potential that the technology uh, has. But uh, it, it, it is just uh, uh, a little afraid about how can I do that? How can I create my wallet? How can I secure my private keys? So I think this is a, a problem, but also I see some opportunities here in Brazil. For example, now I think we have here three ETFs already, so people can have exposure to to crypto assets without this kind of concern. I I see here in Brazil uh, a good vision, a good pressure towards. Crypto. So I see a, a good future to us in Brazil. Jarvis, how do you think something like crypto or blockchain might help the people or the economy in Brazil? I think crypto has a huge potential to unlock new businesses, models, and also new opportunities, new careers. 
And I think in, in a country like Brazil, it's very important. It's uh, an opportunity uh, to, to create a new GDP because I think uh, we have a totally new world that can be built on top of the of crypto technology. So I think it's, it's very important to focus on regulate the technology in, in order to uh, give security to the uh, to the entrepreneurs in order to start business here in Brazil related to to the crypto space. Well, that's a great answer and makes a lot of sense. So, how does someone like yourself, with 25 years of IT experience and probably already on a really deep career track, become aware of and interested in crypto? Yeah, when I was at the university doing my PhD, I, I had a a group of of colleagues and and my mentor. At that time, they already were studying about crypto, so they had some some meetings to talk about the technology and to talk about the the potential in the future. But actually, at that time, I don't have much focus on crypto. So just on 2017. There I start to focus and study about crypto uh, almost every day in my free time. So since then, up to now, I'm doing that almost every day. And I I think that I lost some time, but now I'm up to date and I think the, the crypto is the future. So what was the switch? What drew you from being somewhat interested at university to spending part of every day exploring and trying to understand crypto? I think I become to see more use cases. I become to see the crypto in practice. At that time, I just thinking about the theory, I thinking about the technology. But uh, after that, I start to understand better and also see some applications in the real world and start to see some changes. The value proposition of technology, I knew that that was very, very different and very and very good for the society relating to be an open technology. And most of the cases were about permissionless protocol. So it's a way to democratize the access to the technology. So to me, it sounds very, very interesting and very, very important to to give access to everybody. So I, I start to see uh, real value. I start to see the real potential. So I start to focus my free time in, in something that I really believe. And do you remember when you first became aware of the graph? Yeah. I I attended a, a conference, the Smart Conference last year, and in that conference, uh, Ian Eve did a, a presentation, a very nice presentation about the graph. So when when he starts to talk about indexing and organized data, uh, blockchain data, that phrase called my attention. Because I knew that it was a very important layer that it's very cost intensive in time and, and we need a lot of resources to do that. So I, I see that the graph had a huge potential to transform the, the industry. So at that time, I start to study about the graph. I jumped in the Discord to get to know what was the stage of the project, what the com- that community is all about. So uh, I start to dig deeper in, in order to understand the protocol. It was <laughs> very difficult in, in the beginning because actually the protocol is very uh, complex, but we also have a, a, a very, very vibrant community a community willing to answer questions and to explain all the all the features of the protocol. So it was my my first step in the protocol. And at that time 
I'm trying to understand about the indexer role, but the, the mission control uh, was already in place. So I lost the deadline related to the indexer program, but I stay uh, in touch with the community all the time in order to look for new opportunities. Do you still contemplate becoming an indexer or do you think that that door is closed? After the curator's program, I think it was an option, but the problem is related to the time that you need to spend in order to keep the indexer running uh, up and running uh, smoothly. So I see that this kind of, of role will demand a lot of work that I, not only a lot of work, but a lot of time that I I don't have. So because of that, I think it's better to focus in a role that you can uh, balance with my career. So I think this is my main concern related to the index role. After you became interested in the graph and started getting on Discord and meeting members of the community to learn more and do your research, what happened next? Did you participate as a delegator? Did you get immediately involved in the Graphs Curator program? What did you do? I had the opportunity to to register for the curation program. And uh, it was a very nice opportunity and experience. The curation program, it was like a learning path. So we had the opportunity to learn how to curate and study graph. So we have a lot of tests to execute. And each phase, it was, I think, five phases. In each phase, we have to execute some tests. And all the tests are related to each other. So in the beginning, we had to understand about Web3 applications. And after that, we had to assess a subgraph so we had to understand all the parts of the subgraph. In one of the phases, we had the opportunity to develop a subgraph. And at the end, we had to uh, write blog posts, interact with the community, and on Discord, help each other to, to have the tasks done. So it was a very, very interesting experience mainly related to engage in the protocol in the beginning was a kind of opportunity that I didn't have before. So it was very impressive to see how was in the beginning, how the graph is right now. So to see since the beginning, the creation the building of this kind of technology, it was a huge opportunity. So the creation program was a breakthrough to me and was the preparation of the role that we see in a very, very impressive demand right now. How many people were in that curation program with you? Do you remember? I think it was uh, about uh, 2,000. I think so. Yeah, pretty big. What was it like going through that program and then having to wait until July of this year before curation services went on? I mean, what did you do in the meantime? Yeah, in the meantime, I started to, to be a delegator. So it was uh, a way to participate in the protocol and uh, start to wait to the curation launch. But in the meantime, we also uh, exchange information between the curators in the curator's channel. So trying to, to be up to date and, and to read more about the, the protocol and start to, to understand even, even before the, the curation launch, what was the, the new subgraph, what kind of new information about the, the protocol could impact the curation roles and uh, try to, to be active in the community. 
Before we move on to more information about curation and where things are today, I'd like to ask you about your experience as a delegator. How did you go about selecting the indexers that you decided to stake your GRT with? Yeah, it's a very good question. The first thing that I see is that you have to select an indexer that is active in the community. I think the indexer that engage with their delegators, I think it's a, it's a very good sign of that. It's a, an important indexer that help the community, that deliver good utility for the community. And also, I like to select an indexer that at least have a set of stud graphs that's been indexing uh, a set of stud graphs because we need to know if the indexer has the expertise to index uh, some kind of stud graph. But of course that we see difference in size of the of the indexer. So some indexers can index a lot of stud graphs while the others don't do that because of they they don't have the the same resources the same the same capacity to to index the same number of subgraphs or sub subgraphs more complex than the others. I I see in the future that most likely we'll see some specialized more specialized uh, indexers that will focus on some kind of subgraphs because of the resources they have. And why the others, the big ones, does not need to to select specific subgraphs, but can index all kinds of subgraphs. So uh, I prefer to use basically these two criteria, the engagement and the subgraph. I think the best way to, to, to do that. But I think this, in the future, we'll see some, some difference because now I I have nowadays I am delegating four indexers, but the API is almost the same. So nowadays we still don't have a lot of query fees. So because of that, I think the situation is almost the same. But in the future we we have more uh, input in order to select the best indexers because we will see more information about the subgraphs, more information about the best allocations that have the, the best reward. So I think the situation will be um, more clear. The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, DApps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graph.Foundation. That's the Graph.Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ. Thank you for listening to this podcast and for supporting this project especially those of you who have taken the time to leave a review, rate the podcast, or share an episode on social media. The GRT IQ podcast shines a light on the people working to build the graph, and each week we get to meet a new member of the graph community to hear their story, to get a fresh perspective, and hopefully to learn something new. But the truth about the graph is that it's really about the countless stories happening every single day all across the world, including your story, that will make the difference in the success and evolution of the graph, and ultimately, Web3. You get to write your own story, so if you have the ambition to help build the graph, then take initiative and get involved. Join the graph's Discord, start reading and contributing to posts in the graph's forum, join the graph's Telegram and Reddit channels, and look for ways to make a contribution. They're out there. If I can do it, so can you. Thank you for your support. Bye-bye. I want to go back to the curation program and ask you a question about what you learned during that program that you're using now as a curator. Are there things that you learned during the program that every day as a curator at the graph you're now using? 
Yeah, the first thing I I learned that I think is very important is the capacity to read a, a manifest file. So you need to know in a subgraph if the configuration is the right and if the subgraph is legit. So if the the fields of the schema are the same of the contract, of the smart contract. So these aspects are very important. I'm not saying that you have to be uh, a technical guy to be a curation, but I think it helps. It helps to, to compare the, the subgraph with its sources. Uh, what I mean, I, I mean, comparing with the smart contract, I'm mean, comparing with the, the white paper of the project to see if the data is, is correct if, and if the data is legit. So I think it's an important skill that I learned during the curation program. I think the other, the other aspect is to, to see if this subgraph is capable of generating a query feed. Of course, that we need to know what the application is using about that subgraph. And if that subgraph actually will generate a lot of queries, because you can have a subgraph that's good, but not generate a lot of queries. So we need to know about the application. So this kind of, of skill, I think, also very, very important. And let me see. There is some, some, some aspect that is related to the, the first thing I'm talking about. That, that's about to compare the subgraph with the smart contract. Is that we also can, can see in the list of subgraphs some subgraph that is not produced by the project itself that have that application but some, someone else just pick the, the code and publish the subgraph. So in that case, we will see a code that is correct, but the subgraph is not legit. It's not, the, it's not the subgraph that will be used by the application. So this kind of comparison can help us to select the best subgraph. So I think we have a, a lot of details to to take care and the curation role has some risk so i think it's important to to say that because we risk to lose your money to lose your glp tokens and because of that kind of mistake so you can select a subgraph just for the label but on the background the subgraph is not the right one so i think it's important to to take care, it's, just, it's important to uh, take your time reading and try to understand. And I, I, I saw in the launch of the curation that people uh, hurry trying to, to curate and trying to be early curating some subgraph and you run a lot of risk because in doing that, you are run at risk to choose the wrong subgraph. Those were the things that I learned to help me be a curator today that I, I can use in my, in my prep in order to understand what the best subgraphs can help the community. Jarvis, that's a really great list. I'm so glad I asked that question. So for listeners that are new to curation and want to get involved, this is a really good list of maybe things they should learn so they can participate as a curator. R how to read a manifest file, how to see if the subgraph is capable of generating query fees, and how to compare the subgraph to the smart contract to make sure that it's legit. So really good list, and I appreciate you sharing it. What would be your advice to anybody listening who wants to learn those things but didn't have the good fortune of participating in the curation program? I think a good resource is to go to the DeGraph Academy. There are a lot of resources related to the curator role. 
And uh, besides that, they, they curate a channel on Discord, trying to learn more about the role, they're asking questions. And the last thing is to go to the Explorer, to the Graph Explorer, and select some subgraph there, and go to the GitHub of that subgraph, and try to read the code, at least to understand the intuition of the subgraph, and try to see the schema. I think the one of the most important formations to, to look for, and try to read the blog post on the graph, because a lot of information was uh, generated during the curation program, and that formation is available on the blog, and also in the community, in the Discord. I remember that, we generate a lot of documentation and those documentations are in the Discord. So you can look for those information and focus also on, on the Graph Academy because there, I think the information is better organized and I think it's a good start. Well, I agree with you. I'm a big fan of the work that the Graph Academy is doing and all the documents and tools that they've made available for members of the graph community. So I do want to echo what you've said there, Jarvis, and encourage listeners that want to learn more about curation and just about everything else related to the graph to check out the Graph Academy. So Jarvis, I understand this follow-up question might be a little redundant with the answer you just gave, but I still want to ask it because at the launch of curation, there was a lot of interest in the graph community. You were there and participated in the launch. What did you learn during those first few days about curation and the graph? Uh, it was uh, a moment to take a step back and try to read more about that subgraph that was uh, published. I think we see a lot of people hurrying, trying to to be early curating subgraphs, but uh, because of that, most of the subgraphs that start to appear in the Explorer. They, they weren't legit because actually the protocol is permissionless. So anyone can publish a subgraph, even using uh, an, an open source code. So some people can, uh, using the same repo of uh, a legit uh, application, but publish a subgraph in, in the name of, of them. So because of that, we could see in the first week of the of the launch many many people uh, commit some mistakes and try to curate the graphs that weren't legit. So, in my opinion, it was uh, uh, unexpected behavior because many many people start to to practice the role without having the skills. But now I start to see a different situation because the first it's gone. So now people are waiting uh, more to, to understand, uh, start to, to talking about the, the role of curation and, and start to exchange information in, in order to, to understand which the graph is legit or not. And this kind of movement uh, helps uh, a good sense of what is the new uh, subgraph that that was launched on the platform that is legit, or the others that people uh, start waiting to see more about it. So it's a paradox because the role of curator are incentivized to be early, but at the same time, being early it's a risk. And because of that, the protocol incentivizes being early. So actually, it's a role that we need to have skills in order to to avoid this kind of, of situation. But it's, it's part of the role. I see curator as a, it, it's, a, it, it's a role that keeps the balance of the protocol. Because if the curators curating a bad subgraph, that action will generate a waste of resources and time for the indexers. 
So in doing that, the consequence is that the indexers want to receive the query fees related to that subgraph. And as a result, their delegators also won't be rewarded. And also for, for the curator, the result is also bad because the 10% query fees won't be generated related to, to that subgraph. So the role of the curators is very important. And the curators itself won't receive reward if they curate in bad subgraphs or broken subgraphs. So it's very important to select the best subgraphs that can generate a lot of queries and as a result, a lot of query fees. Hi, this is Java Silva, and I'm a delegator and a curator at the graph. If my conversation with the GRCIQ podcast has helped you, then please consider support for future episodes by becoming a subscriber. Visit grciq.com slash podcast for more information. That's grciq.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening. So how did you keep your head at the launch of Curation when it seemed like there was a lot of people being first? Because like you said, it's a little bit paradoxical. You want to be first, but you also want to verify and identify quality. And yet there's all these people around you being first. I got to imagine that's pretty confusing or maybe even a bit intense. Yeah, my vision is that I have to use a long-term vision. So I know that being early is incentivized, but the idea of the protocol is to reward GRT based on the query fees generated by the subgraph. But uh, at the beginning, we have a, a little uh, a little query fees being generated. So I thought that it would be better to understand what was the best subgraph and thinking about the long term. So if, if I think about the long term, I can avoid those kind of risks to uh, being early in the wrong subgraph and also being late and have the risks to, to burn shares. Because the way to avoid risk is being early because you can mint shares in a reasonable price. So when new curators mint new shares, the, the share price of the curate is such increase. But suddenly, with uh, a good amount of shares being burned, the price decreased. So you, you risk losing uh, your GLT in this process. But if you are thinking about a long-term vision, I think you can wait more and see what the bond curve will produce in the long term. Uh, my vision is that I think it helps for the protocol if you have some kind of mechanism to avoid this hurry to to select the subgraph without taking time to to learn to understand better. That makes a lot of sense, and I think that'll be very helpful for listeners who are contemplating being a curator and understanding that it's a long term role that ha- must have a long term perspective when performing it. For those listeners, Jarvis, that are interested in becoming a curator, is it a full-time role? I mean, is this your full-time job or is this something you do on the side? How do you think through that? I think you can use your the time you, you have. You, you don't need to be a, a full-time curator, in my opinion. In my case, I just use some free time in order to learn, but it's an option to do that with a, a long-term thinking. So I can start to, to learn some the graphs, to learn about some applications that have potential to drive a lot of traffic. So you can do that. You can take your time to do that. So you don't need to stay full time doing that. It's my opinion because you, you have to, to select the best ones and to 
take a look about the, the queue and about the price in order to select the best time to burn your shares. But as I said in this beginning, I think we still don't have a, a lot of queries. So in the near future, we'll have a, a better picture about the whole scenario and how to, to act in order to, to have better reward and a better understanding of the protocol. So if you had to describe the state of curation at the graph as it is today, how would you describe it? I think we are in the early days of curating. I think we, we need to uh, educate more the community in order to curate in the best subgraphs that give more utility to the protocol. And I think we are in the right path. I saw uh, a lot of good formation on the, the Graph Academy. I see a lot of good discussions on this board. So I also uh, see some, some community talk about curators. So I think we are in the right path and we are in the early days. And I think people have to take their time in order to to learn about this role and try to avoid commit mistakes. I think the idea to have a community that decentralizes taking take decisions in order to uh, help the the protocol to uh, work better, I think it's a, a tremendous achievement. So uh, I see a a bright future related to this world. What's your advice for listeners that want to make the move and start participating as a curator at the graph? The first step is to jump in the Discord channel. In the curator's channel, you can see a lot of resources, a lot of talented people willing to answer your questions. And uh, I think the, the main outlet that you have to, to look for. After that, the Curator Academy, and we also uh, have a lot of interesting blog posts on thegraph.com. So uh, I think this, this is the first step. And after that, I think you can use the, the Graph Explorer, use the playground in order to understand which is the graph, uh, how do you can access the, the API, and try to understand the intuition behind the graph. So I think it is the, the first steps to do. What's your long-term vision for the graph? You've been involved with the community for a long time. You're participating both as a delegator and as a curator. And then you've got all this really good real-world experience as an IT professional. So you're a technical guy and understand the use cases. So what is your long-term vision for the graph? I see the graph will be the layer that's saving data in all blockchain. I see the graph is a very uh, needed protocol. I think it will be the main middle between the decentralized applications and blockchain. And I see the graph as uh, actually the Google of blockchain but in the aspect of the indexing and organized blockchain data. And if you think the new internet will be based on Web3, will be decentralized and will be built on top of blockchains, I see the graph as actually the Google of blockchain. Jarvis, I greatly appreciate your time and helping us understand your own journey as you got introduced to crypto, made your way to the graph, and then began participating as a curator, both in the curation program and now that curation's live at the graph. If listeners want to stay in touch with you or follow your work, what's the best way to do it? You can find me on Discord at Jarbas hashtag 4214 or on Twitter at Jarbas underscore Silva 15. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com.
Facebook.com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G-R-P-I-Q Podcast.